Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, one of the, probably the main topic for today, we wanted to just get a handle on how everyone is um, doing their part to attract women to manufacturing careers or manufacturing related trades, um, or say in John's case, um, you know, like the technician uh, trades or HVAC. So we'll go there in just a minute. But um, first, I wanted to check in uh, with everybody and see how the distance learning thing is going for all of you. If anyone wants to chime in and just say, you know, yay or nay, and if there's any challenges, any uh, immediate challenges anyone's having, we'd love to hear about those or successes as well. So um, if I may, I, we have two groups of people at City College. We have the people who, who um, uh, that I, I teach a math class uh, third semester in the MET program. Um, and I was surprised, I, I did a, uh, a survey at the first day of class. And <clears throat> let's say the high 90% uh, bracket, um, all the students had um, they had they had a computer, they had a webcam, and they also had uh, um, a scanner and a printer. So uh, that worked out really well, um, considering they've got to turn in all their um, math assignments handwritten. Um, <clears throat> and and most of these people, um, average age groups, mid thirties, and they're a lot of them are working in the field, so. Um, they, they have a certain amount of disposable income. Um, <clears throat> the second group with the new program, the IMMT program, um, that's a whole different story. I mean, these folks, you know, again, they're in their late 20s, mid 30s, uh, haven't been to school for quite some time. And just getting into the groove is hard, let alone dealing with things like Canvas and Zoom. And um, so it's been really interesting. Um, I've had some private one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, Zoom meetings just to show people how Zoom works, right? Uh, so they're prepared for class. But uh, all in all, um, it's doing pretty well. Nice. All right, good. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, thank you. Anybody else? So um, I'm going to call on. Oh, I, I was ahead. just going to add um, on Jeff. Um, I think the biggest hurdle that we are facing right now with some of our students um, is the lack of, of uh, finances. So they, um, you know, they're, they're um, some some students are just using their cell phones. Um, but the real big one is uh, having um, um, internet. Even if it's not reliable, just having the internet, a lot of folks can't can't afford that. So um, that's that's been a challenge for both uh, faculty and in uh, the college to overcome. So I was I heard somewhere that there is uh, there are they're offering, and when I say they, I'm not really sure who they is or are, but. Uh, somebody's offering, you know, wireless access points for education. Now, are you finding that people are accessing that type of a resource or, you know, is that available to, to those students? How are they getting access? Well, I knew that, that, that the college had a program um, and, it, and it, it just, that they were working with students. I don't really know the details of it. Um, Though I do have one student who lived in Sacramento and he was eligible, um, but then he moved to West Sacramento and <sighs> wrong county. So, so yeah, it, it, only, it only worked for people who who lived in Sacramento County. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. I heard some districts had been setting up hot spots around town where students could go to and get access if they didn't have it at home, but I'm not sure how that would work. 
I'll tell you. I'll tell you what, Chelsea. Did you you raise your hand? Did you have something you wanted to throw in there? I think I. Yeah. Hi guys. I'm Chelsea with Tau Truckee Unified School District. Um, so yes, there are like in our district, we are providing hotspots um, for our students who do not have proper internet connectivity. But in addition to that, the CARES Act provided a lot of money that each county within our state has access to. And I know that Nevada County um, put aside a million dollars for broadband expansion within Nevada County. And so I don't know which wow. prospective counties you guys are dealing with, obviously Placer, maybe some Sacramento County stuff, but it might be worth just checking in with um, Dieter, the IT guy for Placer County and find out if, if Placer at least also took some of their money and allocated it towards broadband. I also know there's a very specific timeline on the Nevada County million dollar, pro and a million dollars is not gonna go very far for broadband, but it's better than nothing. And they have a drop dead date, the people who are applying for the money to put the um, infrastructure in, it's December, it's the end of the year. So they're, it's a really fast turnaround to get um, connectivity. So that could be something, maybe schools need to be on board, educational uh, platforms need to have just some questions going out to different people and find out if that's in your, uh, if you're in the vicinity of receiving some of those services. Nice, thank you. Huh. I think maybe I'll do a little research after this and find out a little bit more about this subject. I didn't know. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. This is good, good info. Plaster, plaster in Sacramento County, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. Um, so, Alex, how, how, how have things been going? at um, ARC, if you don't mind putting you on the spot. A, well, first of all, describe describe for everybody what you're doing, because I don't know if everybody knows, but right. uh, and then Hi, let us know Hi. how it's going. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm a student ambassador working with Autodesk. I'm currently attending ARC in Sacramento. So I'm in a pretty neat, uh, unique position in the sense that I'm a student, but I'm also kind of tutoring other students and faculty how to use this program. So it's a really great look at both, both sides. And what I've been hearing from most of the students is the, that they really, really want the live classes as much as possible. So I know a lot of teachers are doing recordings, which are tremendous and helpful. Um, but a lot of the students really enjoy being able to ask questions, you know, at a, at a time altogether, you can hear other people's questions. So I know it's inconvenient, everyone has different schedules, but that's, I would say overall, the biggest uh, feedback I've been hearing is that the live sessions make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, everybody's missing the live stuff. Nobody knew how important live classroom instruction was until this happened. It's yeah. so true. It's so Don, true. you got your hand up. What's on your mind? Yeah, I just, um, wanted to share what we were doing because um, um, in in our MET program all all the lecture actually lecture and lab classes uh, they're online and they're synchronized right? so on any other program they're asynchronous but um, so we have we have designated lecture times that, that we record and then, um, so we're offering our synchronous classes kind of in an asynchronous mode. So taking the best of both scenarios where people who are working can, can watch the videos, but those who have the time um, um, can actually attend, attend the lecture. And then we're very sympathetic to, to um, our students because they have their own personal family issues that they're dealing with. Uh, you know, daycare, uh, working with their kids, altered work uh, uh, hours, and so forth. So, it, and it seems to be working out really well. Yeah, I agree that having both is really important because if it's live, you have the opportunity to ask questions, but those recordings are also useful if you can't make it to those meetings. So, I think that's a really good idea.
Yeah, that's awesome. That just is for, actually uh, very cool. Sorry. Go for it, Rob. Hey there. Um, I just wanted to say that for Sierra College, we are required to have our uh, lectures all in a, an asynchronous format. Um, but as I'm asking the students what they would prefer, many of them are saying, I want the routine, I want the schedule, and I want the interaction that happens with the real-time synchronous lectures. So um, now that we've sort of gotten the first couple of weeks under our belts, um, I'm finding that what John was saying is, is probably the better way to go is provide both an asynchronous and asynchronous option. And so um, I'll probably be moving all of my lectures from a Camtasia type of production into a, a Zoom session, and then I can bring that into uh, Camtasia if I wanted to edit it later. But um, anyhow, that's, that's what's working for us and for our students um, as we go forward from here. So, um, Roy, are, are, are you in high school? Are you teaching high school or college? No, it's a uh, community college. Okay, Sierra, well, college. Right. Sierra College. Oh, okay, good, good for you. So one of the things I found that was really useful um, in this math class is that I'm using my iPad and then I have a app called Notability and it has a page, um, a writing page. <clears throat> and um, so I just, instead of using a whiteboard, I use my iPad um, and on a shared screen and um, just write the, write the equations and talk about um, what we're trying to accomplish. And, and um, it's actually uh, worked out really, really well. Yeah, I use a Microsoft whiteboard with a um, digitizer pad that that works well too. Microsoft whiteboard right. is a free app. And then the, um, I have like a $60 digitizer pad that works very similar. And then I just share the screen um, from that. Does it, does it lay flat on the table or? Yeah, it lays flat on the table. So it's cool. just like a, a typical writing pad. And right. you can scale it to be um, whatever portion of the screen you want. So sometimes you just have an area that you want to have um, be sort of your scribble pad or scratch pad. You can adjust that size. It makes it so it's not um, scaled for your whole screen. Nice. And it still allows mouse interaction as well and, and touchpad for if you're using a laptop. So it's, uh, and it's Bluetooth. So for about sixty dollars, you can buy that. It's called a Wacom W A C O M uh, touchpad, and it's really, it's really, I think, my favorite because I can integrate it with any system I'm using, and it leaves the proprietary Apple stuff out of the picture. <laughs> so. Yes, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, Apple and Google don't get along too well, do they? Anybody else got something unique they're using that they interact and delivering curriculum? I'm just going to gonna share that, you know, in high school, I'm at Elk Grove Unified, and uh, we have to be synchronous at every single day. Um, and it does make a big difference. In fact, uh, the asynchronous part, there's very little participation from students in. Um, they pretty much don't want to hear you anymore pretty much when you're done. That's kind of what we found. Yeah. So uh, we do Zoom. It's every single day. Um, it ranges from our short day is 40 minutes and our long day is 55 minutes of synchronous. And uh, I found that uh, we get a lot done. We wish we had more time. Uh, my engineering class is actually doing 3D modeling. And unfortunately, not everybody has um, an actual computer. They have a Chromebook. And so they are using Onshape, whereas the vast majority are working with um, uh, Fusion 360. So um, that's actually going pretty well. I wish that we were able to have everybody consistent with the same equipment so that we could. And I know I could have used Onshape, but uh, unfortunately we, uh, we use Autodesk pro um, um, equipment, or I should say um, software here at our campus and always have. And I don't really plan on changing that just for this short period of time. Hopefully it's short. And then um, and Matt, yeah. Matt, real quick, I have a solution for you. Your Chromebook students can access um, Fusion 360. Um, I've been told is, that. It's just, uh, that just means I got to figure out how to do that first, and then I can tell them how to do it. And that's okay. been kind of a, yeah, that's been a little slow on my part. So I just had to go with what I know, and that's just the way it is for this this term right here. So hopefully by next term, no which problem. is October, I know what to do. Um, 
All right. Well, if you need help with that, let me know. We, I, we definitely have resources. We can help you with that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I was going to go to say that uh, my other classes, I have construction classes and building trades, and that is we're just kind of holding on because these folks are not on these classes to do paperwork. I'm just going to let you know. It's just the reality, and I'm preaching to the choir, I know, but um, it's tough. Yeah. Um, do you have do you struggle with attendance because of because of that reason? Um, I think they're manipulating the system. I think that um, we magically don't have enough Wi-Fi to run video, but that just is code for I'm not really here. I just happen to. So um, <laughs> it's just the way it is. I I, I have pretty good mm -hmm. attendance. I average um, either one or two in one class, and maybe up to four or five in another class. Um, it's just the way it is. And that's out of, that's an average of about 35 in each class of so those two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had a, I tried introducing AutoCAD with Onshape and the kids on Chromebooks just said it kept crashing or excuse me, Fusion. I tried putting Fusion on the uh, Chromebooks and they just said it kept, it kept crashing. So I pivoted, I made a pivot to uh, have them write a product review. So online stuff where it's like, okay, well, you look at this product. I showed them some sample product reviews and then they pulled something out of their house. And then I gave them the option to either make a video or a Google doc and submit it that way. So yeah, they're, uh, they're definitely not in my class to, uh, you know, paper assignments. So, and we have our short day is 20 minute class sessions on Mondays. And then we see them for an hour each period an hour every other day. So Tuesday, Thursday is one, two, and three. And then Wednesday, Friday is four, five, and six for an hour each class. And yeah, as soon as I'm done talking and they're like, okay, can we log off so we can do the work? And I'm like, yeah, do the work. Yeah. And then um, I caught some kids, I gave an exit ticket and it was basically like a Google quiz. That was, um, how are you doing? Are you stressed? Does this class stress you out? Three questions. I had you, in Google Classroom, you could have it scheduled like 10 minutes before the end of class and it was due at the end of class. And then I told them, hey, do the quiz. And then out of 35 kids, I had 30 kids do it. And then the other five kids, I turned it in at like four o'clock that afternoon. So. Oh yeah, that's, that's strategy. Yeah, we do that every now and then um, just to keep them honest. But yeah, it's not much a good log out start playing xbox i even had siblings snitch out their older their uh sniblings like right out their sniblings about hey no he's he's playing fortnite on the xbox in the other room so oh my god <laughs> um, you, you have to laugh yeah andrew i don't know if this is related to your situation there's another program called tinkercad i don't know if you're familiar with it or heard of it and remind me again what age group are you teaching I'm teaching high school. I have a uh, freshman all the way to sophomores. Okay. Because I work mostly with youth. I did a seminar the other day and they were introducing Tinkercad. And uh, it, its name sounds like it's for middle school or younger, but it actually has really high level capabilities. But its mm -hmm. formatting is really simple. So that actually might be a great substitute if you can't get Fusion to work, which is pretty data heavy. Tinkercad is, um, in a way, a simplistic version. So I don't know if that's something that might, um, also yeah. its formatting is more similar to like a video game in some ways. So that might be more appealing to your students. Okay. So Just if you I haven't can, heard of it. Well, I've heard of it. I've uh, played with it a little bit, but maybe I could use that to like, and then scaffold Fusion on top of it. Like here's a hobbyist type, whatever. And then here's like your professional design grade. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Tinkercad's probably more hobby based, but it has still a lot of the same learning tools and both yeah. programs are really easy to talk to each other. For example, if you make a project in Tinkercad, you can easily uh, put it in Fusion. But I just thought right. if Fusion isn't working, that might be a great uh, second uh, program that you might be able to use. I didn't realize the two were uh, so close. Yeah, they're pretty awesome. There's a seminar, I forget, it's uh, training the trainer. And I think it's on 
uh, the Autodesk website, and they made all sorts of cool stuff like guitars and uh, just basically more more cool stuff. It's not as heavy on the actual manufacturing side. So I thought that might be more interesting to high schoolers. But sometimes if it's just not interesting, they just don't care to do it, you know? Yeah. Okay. I do use that uh, Tinkercad um, in working with circuitry with uh, my freshman class, but I don't get them until next term. How, how did you like working with Tinkercad? Um, it was it okay. Um, we we were I had them fiddle into all sorts of different things, um, and um, it, it did okay. Um, I, there was a problem that we found that if for somehow the student isn't logged in correctly um, and they have they can end up with multiple accounts and then, then they can no, I can no longer see their work. Um, whereas for the vast majority, all I had to do was just go on and I could see whether or not they had even started the assignment, had they even tried it, how far they got, did it work, and then how accurate was it? Like we did a timer um, and I wanted to check their accuracy and we had a little contest and I couldn't check some of them because mm. for whatever reason, they had somehow inadvertently created a second account and I was there was no longer part of my class yeah I think uh, I've noticed if they if they uh, create an account not using the school email that seems to be causing an issue if they use their personal email I don't know at a high school level if they have a separate account but anyways that I've heard that happening quite often yeah nice well good stuff I love it um, Chelsea had a hand up. Yeah. Jeff, if you don't mind, I have a, like, I know you want to get on to the, um, the uh, women in manufacturing bit, but I have an ask that I just want to throw out to everybody. Um, we just sure. started school. We haven't even been in school a whole week yet. Um, our welding teacher did reach out. If anybody wants to put that kind of in the back of their head, uh, looking for resources, any kind of collaboration or help would be welcome for for her right now i think she's struggling with how to um, do the distance learning part of the welding classes so i'll take any information collaboration um contact information people want to send me that i can pass on to her and i did oh. just read an email somebody mentioned dan turner at U college contact him so i want to put that out there okay um, um, for welding on my advanced yeah. kids last uh march um through one of these they put out resources and it was the miller one book the online curriculum with the modules i mean i have my advanced kids in that and i mean other than not everyone has a welder so you can't really have them run labs but it's a good content delivery and there's a um there's a quiz at the end of every module and I, they have topics so have them look up uh miller one book that was a resource we got from one of these calls last i think march april yeah, and that's something that Dan Turner actually, I think, might have recommended because I know I've been on several of his calls and he talks about talks about that a lot. Yeah. Um, Dan Turner would be a great resource, actually. Um, Steve, were you able to, I know that um, Steve Dykus, he might have stepped away, but he um, was uh, reaching out to some folks. Um, Chelsea, what was the teacher's name? Because I, I did... I think I did get an email from her and I emailed her back and said we were looking into it. Oh, perfect. Jesse, uh, right shell, right shell, I think. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah we, does. I think Todd put an email okay. out. Yeah. And copied you. So you may have reached out to her and thank you for that. I'm just kind of following up behind the scenes to see what else I can get for her. Yeah. And I think what happened is we just, um, we emailed some people and didn't hear back right away and didn't, uh, we just never closed the loop. So I'll make sure that we, we do that. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I know the teachers are, everybody's so busy right now. Even the person I just reached out to is just you know, knee deep, so. Yeah. And Chelsea, just, no problem. this is Steve Vegas. I uh, got that email from Todd and I uh, sent him back the contacts for the local community college welding instructors, as well as four or five local high school instructors. You know, oh, okay. There are some connections made. This was over a week ago, though. Oh, that's perfect. I'll remind him. We're also in the middle of writing all of our uh, grants uh, for the K-12 and the CTIC grants. So he may not have responded back. And what I'll do is offline, I'll go talk to him and get that email from you. So thank you for mentioning that because I'll ask. Yeah. Him. 
Yeah, and actually, um, I don't mind spending time on any other topics. I mean, definitely the main point of today's call was, um, you know, to to talk about recruiting recruiting women to our programs. But, um, you know, but this is really all about what your immediate needs are. So, um, never, you know, never be shy. So thank you, Chelsea, for throwing that out there. So, um, yeah, we can always come back to more stuff, too, after we're done with with our main topic. I really um, wasn't sure exactly how to run this topic, to be honest with you. I I did sit in on a, you know, because I don't really have a whole lot of answers, but I did sit in on a uh, webinar today um, on how to attract uh, women to manufacturing trades. And it was um, it was a pretty um, it was a pretty good webinar. I'm trying to find the exact details of it right now so that uh, I can. Okay, the title of it was "Recruiting Women to Manufacturing from Intention to Action," and it was hosted by the IWITT. Um, and that is an organization that um, specializes in uh, you know, bringing, you know, sort of raising the awareness level of, um, you know, of manufacturing uh, and promoting that as a profession to to the women. So, um, so I sat in on this, and basically, what it was was an overview of a class that they're hosting in October that you would send, that an administration would send a team from their school to in order to put together a strategic plan, an overall strategic plan on how to attract women uh, to the programs in your local region. So they're a national organization and the person running the call was, I uh, forget her last name was Donna was her first name. And she basically uh, has put together this, this program and she's demonstrated success in, in, um, you know, in some cases bringing um, women into a program where it originally had none all the way to 30, 34% of the students um, were female. So she's demonstrated success. She has a proven track record and, She's mapped out the strategy that you take, uh, but what you would do is you would attend um, you would attend this two day session and, with your team, with, with say your dean, you know one of your instructors, and, and other people that would be involved, um, and you would all get together and map out your strategy according to her her sort of her her outline, and. Um, so she didn't give a whole lot of detail away, but she did say enough to kind of talk about some of the don'ts. And I think some of the don'ts were sort of obvious to me. Uh, one of the don'ts was, you know, when you're advertising your program on your homepage, you don't just put pictures of men working on, you know, a CNC machine or a welder or, you know, a press, it, it, and that seems sort of obvious, right? If it's just one guy sitting there. The other thing, though, that I thought was kind of funny and actually was um, something I'd never thought about is that if there's just a picture of a piece of equipment on the screen, that's also not exciting. I think that applies to both men and women. So, <laughs> But I just thought that was kind of funny. Um, that uh, And she had examples of, websites that she had gone to and saw that, you know, they had these pictures that just didn't really speak to women. It wasn't something that, um, that would really get women excited about, um, about the trades. Um, I think the thing that she suggested as an alternative would be, you know, adding women to the picture, but also speaking to, um, uh, I think one of the things that she was saying is, is tell women that they can make a difference. That resonates with women. So, you know, making a difference in your profession. 
um, elevate yourself, um, you know, increase your pay or learn a new skill. Those are, those are things that, that resonate with women. So she was really, um, kind of, um, speaking from that perspective. Um, she also said highlight female role models. Um, and one thing that I thought was interesting as a don't was don't focus on middle school girls. So that for me was kind of a big takeaway because I know that um, up in, at least up in Chico, one of the things that that they really do is is try to promote the manufacturing um, their manufacturing day uh, ex- exhibit really focuses on the middle schools. And I know that they've also had an emphasis on trying to make sure raise awareness at the middle school level uh, for girls in, in these sort of professions and trades. So that, that was interesting, curious to me. And um, she sort of let it uh, be known or just sort of kind of let that be sort of a teaser. And I think to get more detailed information, you would need to attend the you know, her two day consulting session. So that was sort of the overview that I got. And fortunately, I wasn't the only one that's on this call that was on that seminar. Alex was on that seminar and she's cutting out right now. (laughs) She's like, don't call on me. Um, So it's, it's, uh, it's like 600 bucks. Um, for an individual, I'm looking for the cost. It's funny because I had it up, and then in my process of getting on the Zoom call, I closed a bunch of windows, and I think I accidentally closed it. So let me find it. Uh, but Alex, I was curious if you found. Oh, she's gone. Anyway, she was on the call too, and I was asking her her impression, and um, and she thought it was interesting as well, but um, unfortunately, I didn't come away with a whole lot of detail. And I'm just curious about if there's anybody on our call today that has actually done an active outreach campaign targeting women in manufacturing, and if so, how successful have you guys been in in those efforts? Uh, I'd say the closest is Ian Duncan. I'm at Kinney High School and Prospect Community Day School. They're both continuation schools. The closest thing I've done to that is just making sure that uh, women are represented in the content that I'm showing in class, because uh, a lot of times you don't see that. I put in the chat, uh, I use Blondie Hacks. It's a YouTube channel where she goes through and she uses the uh, same machines that uh, other students would use in class. And uh, the link is a little bit further below the comment because I finally got my fingers to catch up with my brains. Um, But other than that, just letting them know they're welcome and it's not a boys only club. And, you know, they're as talented, if not more talented in uh, a lot of the things that we end up doing. Yeah, I think that um, I purposely seek out videos or pictures of anything that happens to have women in it. I do the same for um, for trying to show other ethnicities as well because we want to make sure that we have an inclusive um, um, program. But with the women, like for example, today I even showed a video today on a lady who had built her own box joint jig and this was for my building trades two class and they're working on um, understanding cabinetry and milling and things like that. So um, it's just something that you look for. You just try to find the one that is unlike what you've shown so far. And when it comes to the, the, the women, they want to see what, what it looks like if, um, or whether or not they relate to the person that's on the video. You know, one thing that worked for me also was creating a relationship with the guidance counselors, whether it was at the high school or the community college, and then helping them understand that there are many careers available for the underserved populations and related to engineering, manufacturing, construction. I think that's important too, because these are the people that are going to help, you know, the individual make some decisions on what classes to take. Uh, 
Yeah, I'd have to agree with you there, Steve. We have uh, both of our student specialists and our um, enrollment specialists are female, and they they use that as a, a way to point um, other women into our program and get them involved. And you know, we don't have more than probably ten percent right now at, the, at this point at Sierra College in mechatronics, but that number is climbing, and we're happy to see that. So. Um, some of the work is helping um, by by promoting it. Also, I put a link in the chat to our webpage, and uh, a lot of the girls volunteered to have their picture taken with their projects and in our MEC program as well, just to have that be sort of a, a front welcome screen. So if a female visits our website, they know that they are included and uh, wanted in a lot of different ways. So. so, Roy, I noticed when I was at the last um, uh, you guys have a, like a career fair um, and the last one I think it was in the fall so I don't think yeah. the, I think the one in spring got canceled because of COVID yeah um, but that I noticed there were a lot of women at that career fair uh, a lot of students yeah we're I excited that was about cool that. yeah they're looking for yeah. jobs just like the rest of us are <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah. yeah it is and really I think cool yeah, it's exciting. All right, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, <clears throat> this is the organization. Can you guys see my screen? Hopefully. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so this is the organization that uh, IWITTS.org, and this is the person uh, here, Donna, who gave the presentation today, and basically it was like a pitch for her uh, women tech manufacturing educators uh, online immersion boot camp. Um, and in this session, so if you guys want more information, go check this out. It actually looks like something you might if you were willing to spend the money you needed to build your program out, you're going to come away with a really detailed uh, plan and a program or how to accomplish that. So I came away with a lot of confidence in the um, in, in what she was saying and how she would help you accomplish it. So it's something to think about and um, anyone needs uh, additional information you know, I would check out this web page. I'm going to go ahead and put this in the in the notes, the chat. Okay, I threw that in the chat. So. Um, Anybody else have anything to add in this interesting topic? Hi, this is Karen Fraser Middleton, and I work with Jeff and Steve. I put in the chat box some links to some special populations um, documents that I worked on for the chancellor's office about recruiting women to the maker movement and stem careers and attracting special populations so um, they were based on quite a bit of research and things so they might be valuable for you for you and one of the things we learned when we were promoting the non-traditional employment for women event that was held at sierra college was to really tie in how this career is how you can make a difference right how how can you be welding something that would help people or help a community? How do you like, if you're build designing a bridge, how that might help a community access food and supplies for their families. So tying it back into, you know, how can it help people uh, in the medical field applying these techniques? How can it help um, people in some way so that it's not just the thing that you're making, it's what's the benefit of this thing for society and, and how it makes a difference. Because then there's more of a story to it and a, a way to feel connected um, to, to what, what you're doing in, in your classes and that that might appeal to the female students. 
So Jeff, Jeff if I could add um, what we've done at Sacramento City College. Um, I know our aeronautics department, they had, um, I think they invited junior and senior girls from the local uh, high schools and they had a uh, Rosie the Riveter event and um, they actually disassembled an airplane engine and put it back together. Um, so that was, uh, they were pretty excited about that. And some of the things that, that we've been doing personally um, is we've gone out and um, been involved with uh, Boy Scouts of America because now it's both, it's, it's um, unisex, so we both there's girls and boys. Um, and we've set up uh, workshops where the, where the uh, scouts get to uh, use their hands to, to build different things and put things together. Um, just, just to let them know that there's, um, um, there's other avenues out there other than um, um, going to a four year institution or whatever. Um, and the other thing is that uh, we attend a lot of, uh, try to attend a lot of trade shows. Uh, there was um, last last fall. There was uh, one at Cal Expo, uh, put on by uh, the Builders Exchange, I believe. And on that one, we set up a booth where um, where the students actually um, they cut some some quarter inch copper tubing um, with a tubing cutter and then reamed it out and made a flare joint, but. Um, that was that was um, both both uh, that was actually really enlightening because um, is to watch the students actually try to uh, figure out um, how to cut tubing and how to flare just 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 to watch them um, try to figure out how to hold the tools because I don't think they've ever had tools in their hands before so um, I don't think. Um, I don't think we got um, anybody enrolling in our program because of that, uh, but but um, but maybe but maybe they enrolled in other programs that are more mainstream and more out there, um, and and uh, that would be a, that would be an accomplishment for me if I knew that these high school students went on to some type of um, career tech education because of the experience they had at. at uh, both Cal Expo, Cal Expo and Bill Air Force Base. But those are just different ways to engage with, with, um, with um, people in general. Nice, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that I liked about uh, this uh, boot camp that uh, they were sort of promoting is that you have to bring your current metrics with you. You have to bring your current, you know, uh, percentage of male students enrolled in your programs now and your current percentage of female students enrolled now. And then um, as part of the uh, process, after you've executed your program, you have a, a you know, another meeting where you take and look at your stats afterwards, like, you know, three, six months afterwards. That's built into the strategy. So I really like that aspect to it. So you can measure, apparently with her program, you, you can measure your success and show real results. So I think if, if anyone is, I feel like I'm sort of becoming a salesperson for this program right now, but if anyone were needing to find a way to get this done and get it done fast, this looks like a pretty sure bet. I think don't discount past students either. And Karen mentioned some storytelling. Uh, my daughter took welding. I had no idea the school even offered it at the time. She came home with her gloves and <laughs> she liked it so much that she, it made her really question her career choice. She wanted to be an engineer since she was a little kid. And she said, you know, I really like this welding. I really like welding. So she's maybe looking into a program down in Reno, but um, there's a lot, there's, there was a number of her girlfriends who ended up taking the class after she did, because she was so excited about it. 
she in turn got other people excited about it. So you could do some cool testimonial work, storytelling, past students, videos, whatever it might be from other girls who have done, females who have done um, programs. So the, the ironic thing about this, this, this whole movement is we, we've been doing this for 40 years and we're no farther off now than we were 40 years ago. <laughs> so, so, I mean, hopefully, uh, maybe this this um, uh, this manufacturing boot camp uh, uh, program would will be more successful than we've been in the last forty years. That's that's a good point, John. Yeah. Well, that's why I think nobody's really cracked cracked the code yet. So maybe she has. But I definitely know that um, I think uh, one of the one of the challenges we have is trying to create stuff from scratch sometimes. Or some of the, I think one of the things that we find ourselves doing is creating programs or creating launching initiatives from scratch. And it is nice to know that there is something out there that is being done and it's it is successful and it's available uh, to us if we need it. Or want it so uh, I thought it would be good for us to at least highlight that uh, but I definitely also think like Karen mentioned I, I was at that um, women in non-traditional trades event and actually I had um, one of my um, clients um, I invited her to speak at that event um, or to volunteer at that event and I what I loved about that event was that um, they all the students got assigned to a table and at that table was, um, you know, one of the role models at, you know, at the table and they all got, the girls got to engage with that person. And that was, I think, I thought that was huge. I would love to somehow figure out a way to measure the success of that sort of uh, event because I, I, I have a feeling, I have no proof, but I have a feeling that those are the types of things that really get girls excited about those types of careers because they're, they're seeing somebody else already doing it, somebody that is a reflection of themselves. And uh, those, that's what, you know, I think that's what is going to be the driving factor in getting more women involved in these careers. We, we definitely need to, we need, we need to leverage the women that are already in the careers to come out to more events like that. So, Karen, do we have anything like that? Uh, was that a, a grant? What What was that? Because that was yeah, a that really was cool grant. Event. That was grant funded, and of course, we can't do events for right now. Um, but you know, they did it. We did a number of things with that. The faculty were amazing. The, the girls were in small groups, and they went in and they actually physically did something in welding, and they physically did something in mechatronics. So they all walked out of the event with, um, you know, something that they could take back home and say, "I made this." Right, and so they felt like they'd accomplished. They got a feel for the the labs. They got to talk to women students and the women faculty members, as well as doing that kind of a, it was almost like speed dating. So they would like move from table to table and they'd meet different women. There's ways to access some of that kind of thing online, like uh, a million women mentors is, um, you know, where they've got video clips of women that are in all sorts of different um, careers. I put the link to the Sierra Welding video that has a number of women um, role models and there's a mechatronics one I just haven't grabbed it yet uh, to get that for you um, so I think it's it's exposing them they they had the Mythbusters gal uh, way back when we actually got to talk to her live and zoom and this was like I don't know six years ago when people weren't doing zoom and it was really cool that the girls actually got to find out from her like how she got into the field and you know what excited her the big thing seems to be saying you can do this i believe that you can do this and i'm going to help you get there and most of the gals that i've interviewed over time have all had a dad or a grandpa or an uncle who believed in them and would take things apart with them or let them hang out at their shop and say, yes, you can do it. You can do it. And the faculty that have, you know, had the gals in and being encouraging verbally, um, that does seem to make a difference. 
Nice. That's awesome. Great. Anybody else have anything they'd like to share? Well, we may have we may be able to give you guys ten minutes of your day back, as Steve likes to say. <laughs> Steve, did we miss anything today? No, I think this is great, and I think that the beginning dialogue when people were sharing ideas amongst each other that's really the essence of this call and you know bringing young ladies and the other underserved populations on our campuses into our programs is so valuable it helps us with our reporting for the CTIG or the Perkins grant and things like that but it also helps our communities in so many ways but it, it's not just the teacher or the instructor we've really got to get the other people on the campus to help funnel people you know, these people that we were talking about to our programs. And it's a lot of it's just awareness. So this is good stuff. It's great stuff. Thank you all for dedicating a portion of your, you know, your afternoon, your, your hangover long weekend. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all for, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for hosting. Good information. Thank you. Bye, all. Stay well. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody.